Hello bookworms, I'm Hannah and I'm here today to share with you the best books I read in the month of March. Talk about a month of mystery and wonder. I discovered fairies and mermaids, investigated a murder, hunted for buried treasure, dined on two-layer birthday cheddar cake with some very eccentric cats, painted the world's most famous smile, saw bodies rise from the dead, battled orcs, and discovered what is currently my favorite book I've read this year so far. I'm going to tell you about the books that allowed me to have those adventures, and I'll be going over them in order from least to top favorite, beginning with The Cottingley Secret by Hazel Gaynor, a historical fiction based on two girls named Frances Griffiths and Elsie Wright, who shocked the world in the early 1900s with their photographs of fairies, believed by experts and spiritualists to be incontrovertible proof of the existence of fairies. The quote-unquote true story of the Cottingley fairies is conveyed through a manuscript discovered by Olivia Calvina, a woman who inherits a bookshop in Ireland after her grandfather's death. I have to be honest and tell you my affinity for this book is not unwavering. I was never really interested in Olivia's story. I was charmed by her relationship with her grandparents, but her plight of being engaged to a man she doesn't love and waffling over whether or not she should marry him is hackneyed. However, I thoroughly enjoyed the portion of the book spanning from 1917 to 1920. It's predictable but engrossing, harmoniously balanced between fanciful and sorrowful. And despite Gaynor's excessive use of as sentences, which you guys know I don't like, she often entranced me with beautiful descriptions of nature. I'd recommend this book to anyone in the mood for a light spring read. Next up is a book everyone seems to have on their bookshelves but can't bring themselves to read, a neo-Victorian novel that won the Man Booker Prize in 2013, The Luminaries by Eleanor Catton. The year is 1866, and on a dark and stormy night, Walter Moody stumbles across 12 men who have met in secret to discuss mysterious events that concern a missing person, a suicidal prostitute, and a cache of gold in inexplicably discovered in a poor man's house. No doubt about it, this is a time-consuming 800-page read that's challenging because of its 19 protagonists and its vast intersectional web of coincidence and collusion to say nothing of its baffling astrological charts. It's not a book I could have read cover to cover. I broke it down into 30 pages of reading per day and enjoyed it over the course of one month in small bites. Did the story blow me away? Not really, but it's a book that concludes and just begs to be reread, which obviously I don't have time for right now. The Luminaries is unique. It reads like it fell through a wormhole from the 19th century. It was penned by a woman in her 20s, the youngest person to win the Man Booker Prize at age 28. The erudite narrator is eloquent and flows freely through the nuanced minds of its myriad characters. Catton's descriptions of characters, their appearances and morals, tastes and inclinations and prejudices are some of the best I've read. And the book's structure, divided into 12 parts that wane like the moon, is unorthodox. I'm not sure it enhances the narrative, but it's certainly distinctive. The closest book I've read to this one in terms of writing style, structure, and plot is The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. So if you enjoyed that book, be sure to give this one a chance or pick up The Luminaries if you're in the mood for a challenging, lengthy read about liars and lovers, seances and prostitutes, pirates and buried treasure. Allow me to briefly introduce a 2018 Women's Prize longlist book, The Mermaid and Mrs. Hancock by Imogen Hermes Gawar, a historical fiction set in 1780s London that concerns a man whose life is upended when he receives an infant mermaid's corpse. I really enjoyed this book. I have thoughts, and I'll be discussing them at length in my next video. I am so pleased to have finally read The Adventures of Miss Pettifor by Anne Michaels, illustrated by Emma Block, a delightful short story collection recommended for children ages 6 to 9. Miss Pettifor has 16 cats, enjoys baking, and prefers to have adventures that are not too big, not too small, but just the right size because they fit into a single magical day. On each of her adventures, Miss Pettifor sails away using a tea party tablecloth as a balloon with all 16 of her cats trailing behind, holding on to one another's tails. Their adventures are sweet and simple, paired with delightful illustrations, and delivered with the most 
whimsical, and playful prose I have encountered in a chapter book. This is one of those books that conjures lovely imagery if you read it yourself and makes an amusing read aloud to share with little ones. If you like Mary Poppins or cats or calming stories that make you smile, be sure to check this one out. My audiobook for the month was Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson, narrated by Alfred Molina, a comprehensive biography on the man who gave the world two of the most famous paintings in history, paved the way for future artists, scientists, mathematicians, and engineers, and believe that invention comes from the study of obscure things. Every aspect of da Vinci's life is covered in this book. His illegitimate birth to a peasant girl, the mentors who influenced his work, his rambunctious young boyfriend, his rivalry with Michelangelo, his sensitivity towards animals, his love of staging theatrical productions, his unparalleled understanding of light, his relentless pursuit for anatomical observations derived from cutting into corpses, and of course his brilliance, inquisitiveness, and ingenuity. By crossing disciplines, his work was informed by art, science, math, geology, engineering, biology, and botany. His life and this book are a celebration of learning, knowledge, and curiosity. The only downside to listening to the audiobook is that I was in the car and couldn't see the PDF of corresponding images Isaacson's writing is superlative. That man has a way with words. But it's one thing to hear about da Vinci's drawings, and it's quite another to actually look at them. If you decide to listen to the audiobook, try to ensure you have convenient access to the PDF, or better yet, just read the book. Moving on, we get to a book that won the Women's Prize for Fiction in 1997, back when it was known as the Orange Prize for Fiction, Fugitive Pieces by Anne Michaels, a book I chose to read after I was let down by A Boy in Winter by Rachel Seffert, a book from this year's Women's Prize Longlist that I reviewed in my last video. Fugitive Pieces is divided into two parts. The first part concerns a Jewish boy named Jacob Beer who is orphaned after his parents are fatally assaulted during a Nazi raid in 1940, and the second part follows a man named Ben whose parents survived the concentration camps. I'm not sure I can put into words how powerful this book is. Some of the most horrifying aspects of World War II are painted in stark relief against the backdrop of the warm and loving upbringing Jacob receives from a Greek geologist named Athos. Even though his life is abundant with knowledge and nurturing, Jacob is perpetually haunted by the memory of his family. His meditation on grief and loss is coupled with disturbing nightmares and sorrowful ponderances that longing for the dead may prevent them from finding peaceful slumber. When we switch to Ben, we get a taste of what life might have been like for Jacob, because Ben's parents survived the war, but they are scarred by the experience. They carry secrets about their lives during that time that when they finally emerge decades later, they have a disastrous effect on Ben's life. Michaels demonstrates how devastation ripples outward ruining lives and shattering families long after the war has ended. And since she's first and foremost a poet, she conveys this message in breathtaking experimental prose. The result is an elegy that begs to be read slowly, to be examined, to be discussed, and to be read again and again. I finished reading The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien, the second part of The Lord of the Rings in which our heroes are divided. Some brave the creaking darkness of Fanghorn Forest, and some battle amid a thunderstorm at Helm's Deep, while others make an arduous journey over gloomy stones and barren slopes on their way to the fires of Mount Doom with a tricksy creature following in their wake. Now, this was my second time reading The Two Towers, and I noticed something I don't recall appreciating on my first read, the subtle way Tolkien highlights the bond between Frodo and Sam. For example, in a moment of great despair, Sam kisses Frodo's forehead. They comfort one another in sleep, and in the foreboding darkness of Shelob's lair, they hold hands. This moment in Shelob's lair is one of my favorite lines in the entire book. Sam left the tunnel side and shrank towards Frodo, and their hands met and clasped, and so together they still went on. Is it romantic love, brotherly love, the love of a doting servant, or the connection shared by comrades in arms? I don't know, but these small details effectively heighten my love of this book. Why else do I love this book? 
because it has sentient trees and nameless things that dwell in the dark below, ruthless orcs in epic battles, glimmering rivers that shimmer like glass, and a horse that shines like silver, and we get our first glimpse of my favorite character, the shield maiden of Rohan, Eowyn, fair-faced with long hair like a river of gold, as stern as steel, a daughter of kings. Once I get a few more Women's Prize longlist books under my belt, I will definitely be picking up book three, The Return of the King. My favorite book from my March reading is the kind of book I've been pining for for months. Dreadful Young Ladies and Other Stories by Callie Barnhill, a short story collection of adult literary fantasy comprised of the most effervescent, ornamented, outlandish, exquisite prose. I'll be the first to admit this book isn't for everyone, but I love it. These six stories introduce an array of fanciful characters, some of which include a heroic Sasquatch, a woman who can talk to animals, a gay insect, and an astronomer who fall in love, and magic children born with glowing tattoos on their bellies, and a miracle child with glittering eyes conceived of lightning who may or may not be a pirate witch. The moment I finished this book, I longed to read it all over again. My favorite stories are An Elegy to Gabrielle and The Unlicensed Magician. I absolutely surrendered to the wonderful weirdness of this book, and it's currently my number one read of the year so far. If you're looking for something strange and mystical to tide you over while you wait for Muse of Nightmares by Laini Taylor, this is the book for you. I want to hear about the best book you read in the month of March, and if any of the books in today's video caught your eye, tell me which ones in the comments. Thanks, everybody!